Hey, this is Dave DeCamp from Antiwar.com. This is Antiwar News for Monday, March 25th, 2024. All right, we got a lot to go over today. Uh, The first story at the top of antiwar.com today, Democrats tell Biden to suspend military aid to Israel. So six senior House Democrats sent a letter to President Biden on Saturday urging him to invoke U.S. foreign assistance laws to suspend military aid to Israel due to the country's starvation blockade on Gaza. So this letter said, quote, given the catastrophic and devolving situation in Gaza, we urge you to enforce Section 620I of the Foreign Assistance Act and, as required by that law, make clear to the Israeli government that so long as Israel continues to restrict the entry of humanitarian aid into Gaza, the continued provision of U.S. security assistance to Israel would constitute a violation of existing U.S. law and must be restricted, end quote. So this section of the Foreign Assistance Act that they are citing says that no assistance shall be given to any country when it is made known to the president that the government of such country prohibits or otherwise restricts the transport of delivery of U.S. humanitarian assistance. And it says if they restrict it directly or indirectly. And of course, the U.S. knows that Israel is restricting aid shipments. That's why they started airdropping aid into Gaza. That's why Biden, that's supposedly why Biden ordered this pier to be built so they could deliver aid from the sea. Uh, Israel's blockade and restrictions on aid have put Gaza's population on the brink of famine. Secretary of State Antony Blinken recently acknowledged that 100% of Gaza's population is experiencing severe levels of acute food insecurity, but the Biden administration continues to provide this unconditional military support. And this letter comes as Blinken is supposed to certify whether Israel has made credible and reliable written commitments to use U.S. weapons according to U.S. and international law. So Israel submitted a letter to the U.S. this month claiming that it was complying with the law and the U.S. is supposed to certify whether or not that's true. And the deadline for that is, is Monday, is, is March 25th. So we'll see if Blinken does that today because um, that'll just really go to show how full of it they are if they certify that Israel is following the law with all these weapons that they're giving them. So now, one thing about this law is that there is a subsection that says the president can waive the restriction if he believes providing military aid is in the US's US is in the US's national security interest. And of course, US politicians will still claim that supporting Israel is somehow in the US national security interest even though the US support for this slaughter of Palestinians has led to Many more attacks on U.S. forces in the Middle East, the Houthi attacks on Israeli commercial shipping, and the U.S. responded to that by launching this new bombing campaign. And then, of course, there's the risk of regional war, of Israel provoking a major regional war that Iran could get involved to into, and then, you know, who knows what could happen. So there's all these reasons why it's in the U.S., you know, national security interest not to be involved in this, yet they will probably claim that it is in U.S. interest to keep this this horrific thing uh, going. So the this letter was sent to Biden. It was signed by Representatives uh, Joaquin Castro, James P. McGovern, Sarah Jacobs, Jan Schakowsky, Barbara Lee, and Chelly uh, Pingree. Uh, and, and senators, eight senators, sent a similar letter to Biden earlier this month. So hopefully this pressure does something. Um, Another thing that I mentioned in this article that a lot of people are unaware of is that Israel's nuclear stockpile, its secret nuclear stockpile, also violates U.S. foreign assistance laws uh, that prohibit U.S. aid to nuclear armed states that don't sign the non-proliferation treaty. And the U.S. gets around this law 
by not officially not officially acknowledging that Israel has nukes. They just act like they they don't exist, and this is an arrangement the U.S. has had with Israel since since Nixon basically. All right, so the next one here, bill signed by Biden includes 3.8 billion dollars in military aid for Israel. So on Saturday, President Biden signed a 1.2 trillion dollar government funding package that was passed by the House and the Senate at the last minute to avert a uh, partial government shutdown. And so this is, you know, the annual spending bill. It includes the annual military spending bill, which has the 3.8 billion dollars that Israel gets each year. Um, so Israel's still getting that money despite the atrocities that they're committing in Gaza. Uh, and this bill also cut funding, officially cut funding for the UN's Palestinian Relief Agency, UNRWA. And this cut comes as as Gaza is on the brink of famine. So the U.S. provides Israel with this $3.8 billion in military aid each year under a 10-year memorandum of understanding that was signed by the Obama administration. The $3.8 billion is divided into two categories. You have the $3.3 billion in foreign military financing, and that's a State Department program that gives foreign governments money to purchase American weapons. Uh, and then there's also $500 million to fund Israeli missile defense systems. Uh, so APAC, the pro-Israel American lobby group, they celebrated this, that this money was included in the funding bill that Biden signed. And it's interesting what they said. I'll just read what they put on uh, Twitter. They said, quote, Congress just passed and President Biden signed into law $3.3 billion in vital security assistance for Israel without added political conditions, end quote. So they're happy that there's no conditions, no added conditions. It's still unconditional aid. And then, you know, you look at the contrast here. You have UNRWA, which is a U.N. agency that the U.S. funds, uh, gives humanitarian aid to, a few hundred million dollars, I believe, uh, was what they did give them. And then you have Israel, this country that the U.S. provides military support, bombs, all, all this stuff. And, and you see that the Israelis are killing all these civilians, starving all these people. And then you have UNRWA. You have Israel made these claims that 12 of their employees were involved in the October 7th attack. Uh, and they have a lot of employees. 12 isn't really that many. In response to that, the U.S. immediately cuts the funding, and then it turns. It comes out later that Israel hasn't prevented, hasn't presented any real evidence for these claims, and UNRWA is alleging that its staff was tortured and and interrogated, basically forced into making false confessions about UNRWA's relationship with Hamas. Um, so the spending bill bans the funding of UNRWA until 2025. And it does provide $175 million in aid for Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza that won't go through UNRWA. And that's a $50 million, that's $50 million less than what the U.S. allocated for the Palestinians last year. Um, so aid to the Palestinians gets cut. And who knows how they're going to get this aid into Gaza um, with the restrictions and, and, and all that. So... Uh, all right, so the next one here, Israel bars UNRWA aid to northern Gaza as the region nears famine. This article is from Kyle Anzalone at the Libertarian Institute. So UNRWA announced on Sunday that Israel was not allowing any of its aid shipments into northern Gaza uh, anymore. They said that uh, the Israeli authorities informed the UN that they will no longer approve any UNRWA food convoys to the north. And northern Gaza is where people are facing the worst conditions where northern Gaza was completely obliterated uh, and this siege was put on and and the border crossing the aid the only two border crossings that are open for aid which is the Rafah crossing from Egypt into Gaza and then the Karam Shalom crossing from Israel into Gaza those are in the south so it takes a while for these aid deliveries to get to the north um, and so now Israel's cutting more, uh, even more uh, deliveries to northern Gaza. And then this next article here, Man-Made Starvation, the Obstacle to Gaza Aid Deliveries. This article is from The Guardian, uh, and it basically just goes through how Israel is restricting aid. Um, you know, they're still letting some trucks in, but it's not nearly enough uh, for what people need. And you could see on the map here, you see the whole Gaza Strip this long border that it has with Israel. Uh, you know, I think that's over 20 miles. 
and <clears throat> the Karim Shalom crossing is pretty close to Rafa, and these are the only two crossings that are open for trucks to get in. Uh, and it just really kind of goes to show how severe this blockade is. And of course, Israel bombs, you know, if, if you have a fishing boat, um, you can't go out a certain amount of miles off the coast or or you'll get bombed by Israel. So it's under complete land, sea, and air blockade. <clears throat> All right, so the next one here, footage shows an Israeli drone killing four civilians. So this article's from Middle East Eye. So this came out last week. Um, footage obtained by Al Jazeera shows an Israeli drone tracking and then attacking four young Palestinian men killing them all in a series of strikes. So these are four what look like young men walking down the st- around in, uh, this was in Khan Yunus in early January. Yeah, at the beginning of January. So when the s- attack on Khan Yunus was really uh, in full force, and if you watch the video, it's really, really horrific to watch. They are clearly unarmed, um, these four men that are walking, and a drone hits the four of them and then what's really horrific is that two survive and as they're trying to get away the drone comes back and finishes the job um kills the third one and then the fourth the last survivor you see him trying to i mean you see him trying to limp away and then he begins crawling away and again clearly unarmed out in the open and you see they it's crazy i mean it's just crazy if if you're listening you sh- you should just watch the video um and you know it really just speaks for itself and this was leaked uh to al jazeera i'm not sure how they obtained it uh exactly but it is just what looks like murder uh you know cl- clear as day and this is just one example of this i'm sure that this has happened uh, quite a bit, and Israel hasn't put it out, obviously. All right, so the next one here, Gaza girl begs rescuers to save brother first as family is killed. So this article's from BBC, and it's a really horrific story. It's about this girl in Gaza. She's 12 years old. There was a video when her family was bombed uh, in their home, and there was a video of Palestinian rescuers trying to dig through the rubble and you could hear a voice, a shout from the rubble and it's the the girl, her name's Alma and she says, don't help me, help my mom and my dad and please help my brother, he's a baby, he's only 18 months old and this was in December, on December 2nd and BBC interviewed her and uh, that's what this story is and what she said, I mean, she woke up under the rubble and she was looking for her brother, and she found him with his, and his head was severed, and he, he's 18 months old. I mean, there's a picture of this kid in here. I mean, it's just so horrific. Um, and, you know, this is just one anecdote from one of these kids that uh, was stuck under the rubble, and there's so many thousands that, that not only have been killed, tens of thousands that have been injured and and maimed and, and wounded in this, and she lost her whole family, so now she, she's an orphan. All right, so the next one here, big news uh, in Russia on Friday. There was this horrific terrorist attack on a concert hall near Moscow, and the death toll has risen to 137. So Russian authorities said on Sunday that the death toll in the terrorist attack on a music hall outside of Moscow has risen to 137. This is from the Russian Investigative Committee. They say that three of the dead were children. And Russia has said it detained 11 people over the attack, including four people they said were directly involved in the shooting. There was a video published by Russian media showing one man being interrogated, and he said that he was paid 500,000 rubles, which is about 5,400 U.S. dollars to carry out the attack. And the four men suspected of carrying out the shooting were all citizens of Tajikistan, and three of them pleaded guilty during a court appearance on Sunday night. They will all be held in pre-trial custody until May 22nd. So ISIS claimed responsibility for this shooting, and the U.S. has backed that claim. Uh, But Russia has not formally attributed blame for the massacre. So it's kind of strange to see the U.S. saying, no, 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 it was ISIS. 
trust us and Russia isn't making that claim, isn't attributing blame to them yet. At least, you know, we'll see, we'll see what comes out here. But the U.S. publicly warned two weeks ago that extremists ha- have imminent plans to target large gatherings in Moscow to include concerts. They specifically warned that concerts might be targeted. And that was two weeks ago put out by the U.S. Embassy in Russia. The U.S. said that they also warned Russia. Um, but, you know, how is Russia supposed to take the U.S. US warning seriously when the U.S. is backing the Ukrainian military, which is carrying out all sorts of attacks inside Russia? Um, so Russia is hinting at potential Ukrainian involvement. Again, the, I haven't seen them say it was ISIS or, or anything like that, but they are hinting that Ukraine might have been involved. Putin said that the attackers attempted to flee to Ukraine and that the Ukrainian side created a gap in the border for them to escape into. And then Russian Foreign Ministry spokeswoman Maria Zakharova said that the U.S. was trying to bail out Ukraine by blaming the attack on ISIS. There's all sorts of speculation you could get into here. The idea that uh, it was Ukrainian intelligence, maybe, and then that would mean that uh, by effect it would be backed by the U.S. But uh, ISIS-K, the, the U.S. has specifically pointed to ISIS-K as, as being responsible. And a lot of people kind of have this idea that ISIS doesn't really exist anymore. But um, ISIS-K has been, you know, the Taliban has been fighting them uh, since the U.S. left Afghanistan quite a bit. One really amazing thing that I covered, this was a few years ago, and it didn't get any attention. This was when the U.S. was still in Afghanistan. It came out that the U.S. was actually giving the Taliban air support when it was fighting against ISIS-K in northeastern provinces of Afghanistan, where the group is based. Um, And this was when the U.S. was still bombing the Taliban. This was under Trump when they were, like, really ramping up drone strikes against the Taliban. ISIS-K would start fighting. No, sorry, the Taliban would go fight ISIS-K, and then U.S. drones would, would show up and give them air support. I mean, it's just goes to show how U.S. foreign policy is just such a mess that they're giving the Taliban air support in one part of Afghanistan and bombing the hell out of them in another part. Um, but anyway, they took credit for that big bombing in Iran that happened uh, in January. And there was also uh, Russia said just a few weeks ago that they thwarted an ISIS attack on a synagogue near Moscow. And there was a shootout there, and they, they killed the, the assailants. Um, so lots of possibilities here, not really ruling anything out yet. I'm curious to see if what who Russia is going to blame. Uh, these are Tajiks, and there are Tajiks in ISIS-K. Um, but there's also a lot of people from Tajikistan living in Russia, about 1.5 million. Um, at, well, not from, but ethnic Tajiks living in Russia. Uh, but it's weird, you know, you see the U.S. declaring, you know, saying it, uh, acting like they know who did it, even though Russia hasn't said. Um, National Security Council spokeswoman Adrian Watson, she denied that there was any Ukrainian involvement in the attack. She said, quote, ISIS bears sole responsibility for this attack. There was no Ukrainian involvement whatsoever, end quote. And I think another possibility is is Ukraine, you know, some elements of Ukraine, Ukraine, people inside Ukraine being involved or giving them some sort of assistance without, you know, uh, anybody in Kiev knowing about it. But there's all sorts of possibilities. I don't again, I don't want to speculate too much. Let me know what you think. But it's funny because Scott Horton called me the day before this happened and he sent me this article from Washington Times. And this article is about ISIS-K, how ISIS-K is is targeting Russia, Iran, and the Taliban. And the article is basically saying that the U.S. Uh, was in kind of a tricky predicament because they don't want to give too much information to Russia, like basically saying that they shouldn't give them information if ISIS-K is planning attacks against the U.S.'s enemies, uh, which is really crazy. Um, and he was saying, you know, that... the these groups, ISIS, you know, is still, uh, these, these attacks are, are possible for for them to carry out. But again, there's also the Ukrainian side to it, and they have been carrying out all sorts of attacks, uh, inside Russian territory. All right. So the next one here, Kremlin says that Russia is in a state of war in Ukraine due to the West. So one thing that happened on Friday that was kind of overshadowed by the terrorist attack Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov said that Russia was in a state of war in Ukraine. 
And that is significant because up, Russia has always referred to the war as a special military operation. Um, so Peskov actually said that this doesn't mean that there's any legal changes. It's still a special military operation, but he's saying we are in war. It has turned into war for us. He said, quote, we are in a state of war. Yes, it started out as a special military operation. But as soon as this group was formed, when the collective West became a participant in this on the side of Ukraine, it became a war for us, end quote. Uh, his comments came as Russia was ramping up missile strikes in Ukraine in what was seen as retaliation for Ukrainian forces stepping up attacks on Russian territory. And I've covered this. Uh, there's been a lot of drone attacks, raids by these militants, these so-called Russian volunteers uh, who have been launching ground attacks into Belgorod and, and Russian border regions, and also the artillery shelling uh, of Belgorod and other border regions. Remember, Russia was saying they're going to evacuate 9,000 children from the border areas. A uh, Ukrainian official said that Russia's missile strikes on Friday were one of the heaviest attacks on Ukraine's infrastructure of the war. They said that five people were reported killed and over a million experienced blackouts. So the heavy missile strike also comes as Western leaders have been speaking more openly about NATO's involvement in the war. So this also could be a response to all that bellicose rhetoric we're seeing from Macron about sending troops to Ukraine, this really insane stuff. So, uh, you know, and I think we should be very concerned that if Russia determines Ukraine was responsible for a terrorist attack like that, how they could escalate things here. Because if they think Russia, sorry, if they think Ukraine was behind it, then they think uh, the U.S., uh, the, the West, NATO was behind it. They could really escalate this. There's also the crackpot theory that it was a Russian false flag, which I've seen from some Ukraini uh, Ukrainians say that. Um, Russia has no you know, reason to do anything like that. I mean, they don't need any pretext to escalate the war in Ukraine. They have plenty of pretext. They, you know, they, they wouldn't need a big massacre like this. Um, so that's just, I think that's complete nonsense. But anyway, it's just, who knows how this thing could escalate if they determine that Ukraine was behind it. All right, so the next one here, Israel attacks northeast Lebanon, killing two. This article is from Jason Ditz. So overnight and into Sunday, Israel carried out a flurry of attacks against northeastern Lebanon, targeting a building they claimed was a weapons workshop and going after a vehicle outside of the city of Baal Bek. The weapons workshop, according to Israel, was used to store weapons. In reality, officials say it was an abandoned two-story building that had stayed empty for some time. Four people in surrounding buildings were injured during the attacks on that structure. Elsewhere in the Becca Valley area of Suwari, Israeli planes targeted a car and killed at least the driver. Israel did not explain the rationale behind the attacks, but the driver was said to be Syrian, and the car belonged to an owner of a supermarket for whom he had been delivering food. Hezbollah issued a statement later confirming that two of its members had been killed but did not provide details yet as to where they were killed. Um, it's possible that the driver of the car may have been one of the two. So, of course, Hezbollah has strongly um, criticized Israel for these attacks, and Hezbollah ret retaliated by firing some 60 Kat Yusha rockets into northern Israel. So the daily attacks continue. Uh, on the border with Lebanon and Israel. All right, so the next one here, the U.S. gets involved in a territorial dispute between China and India. So China has hit back at the U.S. for siding with India in a territorial dispute over Arunachal Pradesh, which is a state in northeast India that's claimed by Beijing. Last week, the State Department released a statement saying, quote, the U.S. recognizes Arunachal Pradesh as Indian territory and strongly opposes any unilateral attempts to advance territorial claims by incursion or encroachments, military or civilian, across the line of actual control, end quote. And the line of actual control is a demarcation line separating Chinese-controlled an Indian-controlled territory, and they have some disputed territory in different parts of the border. Arunachal Pradesh is in the northeast, um, and the areas where they've had clashes over the past 
few years, most notably in 2020, if you remember, in the summer, or it was June 2020, there was a clash between Chinese and Indian troops, and 20 Indian troops were killed and four Chinese were killed. That was in, in the west. Um, north, north uh, west of Arunachal Pradesh, but if you look at a map of India uh, in the north. So India bases its claims to Arunachal Pradesh on what they call the McMahon Line, which was a boundary agreed upon by the British and Tibet in 1914 without China's input. China briefly controlled this territory after the 1962 Sino-Indian War, but it ceded the territory and withdrew back to that line that was drawn by the British Empire. Um, So China responded to the U.S. making this statement, wading into this territorial dispute, and said, quote, China strongly deplores and firmly opposes this. The China-India boundary question is a matter between the two countries and has nothing to do with the U.S. side, end quote. So uh, the reason why I wanted to cover this is because since that fight between Chinese and Indian troops in the Galwan Valley along the line of actual control up high in the Himalayan mountains, very far from the U.S., since that clash, and, and the Chinese and Indian troops deployed to these areas don't have guns. It was with, like, bats and, and clubs that they fought with. Since then, the U.S. and India have really increased their military ties. Uh, and one thing that the U.S. did was they signed this intelligence-sharing agree- agreement in October 2020 called the Basic Exchange and Cooperation Agreement, and that allowed the U.S. to share satellite data with India. That helps India... The U.S. helps India with surveillance of Chinese troops along this border. And there was a report in U.S. News last year that said in December 2022, there was another clash between Chinese and Indian troops. And during that, the U.S. shared intelligence, with help, basically helped India by sharing intelligence. And this is something I just think so few people are aware of, that this is always a risk of a war between India and China, two nuclear-armed powers. And the U.S. has gotten itself pretty involved with uh, helping India with intelligence. And there's also been the U.S. has been doing military drills in this area. Um, and again, this is an area near near where the, the clashes were, uh, the western part of the line of actual control, which is basically the think of it as the border between India and China. So it's just an area that I like to keep an eye on. And now you see the U.S. coming out strongly backing India in this territorial dispute uh, with China. And and another thing, since that 2020 clash, that's when India really started joining kind of the, the U.S. and these anti-China alliances and, and military drills with the Quad and, and things like that. It really soured relations between China and India. All right, so the next one here, another territorial dispute that the U.S. has involved itself in. Uh, China warns the Philippines not to escalate tensions in the South China Sea. So over the weekend, there was another encounter between Chinese and Philippine vessels in the South China Sea near 2nd Thomas Shoal. And that's the reef that the Philippines has a grounded World War II era era, uh, ship that it uses as a base of operations. And they try to resupply that ship. And China blocks these resupply missions because China claims the reef as well. Vietnam and Taiwan also claim this reef, uh, but it's China and the Philippines that are kind of uh, always having these these encounters over it. And China fired the Chinese vessel, fired some water cannons at a Philippine vessel over the weekend. Uh, and these these things happen a lot, but they they've been happening much more since uh, Ferdinand Marcos Jr., the current president of the Philippines, came into office in 2022. So, uh, and another thing was after this latest incident, China released this statement saying stop escalating tensions. Of course, blaming it all on the Philippines. The Philippines blamed China. Uh, the U.S. also put out a statement reminding China that the U.S.-Philippine Mutual Defense Treaty applies to attacks on Philippine boats in the South China Sea, basically saying if you start shooting at the Philippine boats, if this turns into a shooting war, the U.S. is going to intervene. That's what the U.S. always says when these things happen, which I think is pretty crazy, so that's why I try to always cover it. And then the next one here, the Philippines to build Batanas Port near Taiwan without U.S. help. 
This article is from the South China Morning Post, and basically I've covered this a few times that um, these Philippine officials in Batanes, which is the Philippines' northernmost province, islands that are close to Taiwan, they were saying that the U.S. military was going to fund the construction of a new port on this island, but now they're saying that the U.S. will not be funding it. They had talks about it, and now um, they're not going to. And the article here says it's probably because they were just too worried about it raising tensions, it being too much of a source of friction uh, with China about the U.S. presence in the region. All right, so the last story here. Most Americans expect a world war within the next decade. So this article is from Kyle Anzalone at the Libertarian Institute. And if you just listen to this show, you, you might be expecting a world war within the next decade as well and not really be surprised by this poll. Uh, but it says the majority of Americans believe it is likely that the U.S. will be involved in a world war during the coming decade. Um, and Kyle mentions all the potential flashpoints, of course. And according to a new YouGov poll, 61% of Americans responded that it is very or somewhat likely that a world war will break out in the next five to ten years. So that's very soon. I try to be as positive as I can with this job, and I really hope that that's not going to happen. Five to ten years is very soon. I hope something gives with this this thing in Ukraine and, and there's some sense and tensions ease with China. But, of course, I uh, can't be too optimistic. Um, but hopefully it doesn't turn into world war this this quickly. I don't know. But uh, the poll also found that many more people did not, that the majority uh, did not want to fight the war, that they wouldn't enlist or volunteer to fight in this world war. Uh, so that's it for the news for today. Please go check out our viewpoints. One from Ted Snyder. What does the coup in Niger tell us about the war in Ukraine? One from William J. Astore. Cutting the Pentagon down to size. One from Daniel Larison. Hawks pushing for the axis of evil reunion tour. And one from Judge Napolitano. Can Congress ban TikTok? And our spotlight from Ahmed Khan. A harsh truth. Biden on board for ethnic cleansing. So please go check all that, that out. That was a lot of stuff I went over today, all over different conflicts all over the world. Um, anyway, I hope everyone had a good weekend. Um, you could always support this show by sharing it. Oh, one thing I want to mention. So I saw someone left a review on the Apple podcast and said that they were having trouble downloading the show, that it was saying the show wasn't available. So let me know if that's a problem for anybody else, if you had to like go to a different uh figure out a different way to listen to it because i think someone said that to me on twitter too that, so i'm not sure if it's the same person or not so let me know if that's a common problem I'll, I'll see if i could try to figure it out the download numbers haven't really changed um and nothing to indicate that there's a big problem um anyway follow us on instagram it's looking really awesome over there follow us on twitter i will be back tomorrow with some more news thanks for listening